Hi everyone, welcome to day two of MockCop. Yeah, like welcome. Another. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> so this is Josh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm Josh, I'm an event coordinator for MockCop 26. I'm living in the UK at the moment, um, and I guess that's all you really need to know about me. Mana, what about you? Awesome. Hi everyone, my name is Mana, and I'm actually 25, one of the older ones in this group. Um, I've actually been helping out as an Asia coordinator. So for those of you who have been in Asia, I've been in contact with you most likely. Uh, really excited to be here and introducing you to our lovely guest speakers. So yesterday you guys did, I hope you really enjoyed the opening ceremony because I really did. Uh, Josh, should we start talking about the pigeonhole? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Actually, I think your introduction there was so much better. So I might, I might add a little bit to me. So I've been working on the program and schedule. So trying to make sure that everything happens at the right time. I've been doing some press and media stuff um, and I'm 18, so I'm a bit younger, um, but I'm still not one of the youngest. We've got a really um, diverse range of ages in our staff team, which is which is wonderful. Um, yeah, so yeah, like like Mana said, we hope you really enjoyed the opening ceremony. Um, it was it was really good fun and it was it was great to hear from the UN Youth Envoy. That was really exciting and to hear from Alok Sharma and uh, the minister from Italy. That, that was really good. Oh, yeah. Um, it was yeah. so cool. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it was really exciting, sort of just looking forward to what's going to be happening over the next week and a bit. Um, but yeah, I feel like I've derailed this enough, so we might move back onto the pigeonhole. So um, as you're probably aware from yesterday, we're going to be using pigeonhole throughout this um, event. And we've got a pigeonhole specifically for today. So if you go on to pigeonhole.at forward slash mock that will give you all of the days that we've got interactive sessions. There'll be one for today, which is the first video release. So some of the speakers that you'll be seeing from today um, that me and Mana will be introducing you to will appear later at uh, two days time on a panel. So if you have any questions during their speeches, just type them in, tag the speaker, tag the topic that you're asking about, and you can upvote your favorite questions. Uh, the best questions, the ones that we really like, the ones that you really like when you're upvoting, we'll ask to the panelists in two days' time. So make sure you go there um, and engage with that in content. And hopefully, we'll see you in two days' time on the panel. Awesome. Yeah, no, everyone keep on rolling those questions in because we're really excited to read all of what you have in mind and really engage those questions into what the guest speakers have to say as well as said two days later. All right, so shall we start introducing the guests then? You wanna yeah, go, Josh? That's a good idea. Yeah, looking forward to it. Lovely. I think oh, yeah. you're the first one. To... Yeah, I'm the first one. This, <laughs> is, this is really professional. Um, we, we've obviously practiced this loads. <laughs> so Quite a our, load. first speaker, <laughs> our first speaker is Abigail Kima. Abigail mm -hmm. is a passionate environmentalist who is focused on making positive change towards creating a sustainable world for all. Abigail completed her bachelor's degree in environmental science, resource conservation, where she awaits her graduation in December 2020 from Kenya Atta University in Kenya. She is the Africa Youth Lead for Marine Arctic Peace Sanctuary Maps under the Pavari Foundation, which is a campaign that advocates for the protection of the Arctic sea ice. She coordinates all the maps chapters in Africa. So, I mean, that, that was quite a mouthful. Sorry if I messed up some of those names. Um, you obviously do a lot, Abigail, and it's going to be wonderful to hear from your experience and on the topic. And I should probably add, actually, that um, Abigail is going to be talking about climate justice, which is one of the five key themes to MockCop, and we're really excited to kick this off. So over to you, Abigail. Hello, my name is Abigail Kima, a volunteer with Poverty Foundation, an international nonprofit dedicated to a healthy world. It is an honor to be speaking at this year's Mock COP26, and I would love to appreciate the team that put this together. We live in an interconnected world. We each are a part of something bigger than us, like drops of water in the oceans of life. Whatever we think, feel, or do ripples like a wave through this ocean and touches everyone, and then in turn, that touches us. We can also see it in how one person getting sick on the other side of the world can cause our neighborhood to shut down. We can see it in how acts of kindness can spread across the globe. If you have been feeling that something is terribly wrong with our world, you are not alone, and you are not wrong. 
Even if you feel powerless faced with what may seem huge or unsurmountable, the truth is you have the power for change. And that is what this presentation is about. For centuries, people used to believe that our world was flat. Eventually, we came to understand that the earth is round. But it's time we see things even more clearly. We and our world exist within a vast and intelligent whole. And when we understand the power we have because we are interconnected, we can change the world. Here is someone who understands this, and she dreams big and puts it into action. During an unusually hot summer in Toronto, Pavati was about to do a concert tour in Asia, but she kept having a dream of lying on ice while a blue whale swam below. Three weeks later, she was in a remote village in the high Arctic on her way to the top of the world. That's where two Inuit elders greeted Pavati and said, You are the one who has come to do healing for the planet. We knew you were coming, the well told us. In that moment, Pavati understood we are all interconnected. Nature's intelligence will work through us if we are willing to listen. Here is Pavati making history in the northernmost musical performance ever. While Pavati was in the Arctic, she met with elders, hunters and ecologists. She spoke on city council and presented and performed at schools. Everyone she met gave her the same message for the South. The ice is melting, animals are dying, people are suffering. After Poverty returned to Toronto, she created Poverty Foundation with a mission to immediately protect our planetary life support system, the Arctic Ocean. For millions of years, long before humans ever walked on Earth, the Arctic Ocean has kept our planet cool like an air conditioner and healthy like a medical mask. It does this in seven important ways. It protects our homes from rising sea levels. It regulates our world's weather patterns that grow the food and the resources we all depend on. It safeguards us from a drastic rise in global emissions providing us with clean air. It protects us from future pandemics by supporting our global immunity. It helps to balance our economies by preventing natural disasters. By doing all this, it preserves stable, healthy societies, and it supports world peace. But here are two main problems. The ice is melting very quickly, and governments and businesses around the world want to profit off the thaw. We must change this for the following reasons. Scientists at Yale University have shown there is 75% less Arctic sea ice in the summer than there was just 50 years ago. Where the ice once reflected half of the sun's heat back out into space in what we call the albedo effect, the exposed Arctic water now absorbs 90% of the heat, changing our world's air conditioner to a warming kettle. When the sea ice melts, the Arctic air warms up, then so does the land. This is making sea level rise all over the planet. As the ice melts, global weather patterns destabilize. Floods and droughts are on the rise, hitting hardest in vulnerable areas. A heating planet also means crop failures as well as water and food shortages. Meanwhile, by keeping Arctic seabed oil and gas off limits, the Arctic ice has been protecting us from 148 trillion kilograms of carbon dioxide being emitted into the atmosphere that would further heat the planet. This means the newly open waters threaten our transition off fossil fuels to renewable energies. In addition, the Arctic Ocean is a safe refuge for animals that help us breathe. 17 different species of whales, three of whom live there year-round. Through what is known as the well pump effect, whales bring nutrients from the ocean depths to fertilize phytoplankton at the ocean surface, which capture carbon out of the air and are responsible for half the oxygen we breathe or every other breath. Phytoplankton also capture nearly half of global CO2 production, equivalent to 1.7 trillion trees a year. But as ship strikes are a leading cause of whale deaths, exploitation of the Arctic Ocean threatens both whales and us. Actual fishing trawlers are now damaging the ice as well as the ocean flow. Large ships break up the ice. The ice becomes dark from dirty fuel so that it now absorbs rather than reflects the sun's heat, further accelerating the thaw. 
Companies look for oil and gas in the ocean floor by firing air guns into the water that are 100,000 times louder than a jet engine every 10 seconds for 24 hours a day. This is devastating to whales who live and navigate by sound. But the pursuit of oil and gas in the vulnerable Arctic Ocean doesn't just harm the whales. Scientists agree that the Arctic oil must remain off limits to keep the entire world from heating up more than 2 degrees. The air pollution from burning fossil fuels kills 10,000 people every day. But that's not the only threat that could take our breath away. Arctic ice has been keeping the lead on literally thousands of years of viruses and bacteria. In addition, scientists estimate that Arctic soil contains methane equivalent to four to five times all the carbon dioxide humanity has emitted since 1850. And as the permafrost melts, methane erupts into the atmosphere in explosions that leave craters like the ones you see here. They can be big or small. What scientists are saying is that the damage from a really big one would cause extreme heat stress, droughts and storms that will undermine our global economy. The cumulative effect of all these stresses on our world, heat, rising sea levels, natural disasters, crop failures, disease, economic instability, lead to social unrest, mass migration and refugees. It is important to consider that the selfish thinking that led to these problems in the first place feeds more suffering in turn. Everything we do affects all life. The Arctic Ocean's ice is melting because our social, economic and political systems around the world are often driven by decisions that focus on short-term gain rather than on long-term benefit. When we close ourselves off from the good of all, our world gets sick and so do we. What was a natural peace sanctuary for millennia is now a place of growing and ease. As the Arctic Ocean's ice melts, nations are sending in armed forces to assert territorial claims to what lies beneath. But governments and businesses moving into this critical ecosystem are putting us all at risk. The only sane choice is to get out. Protecting all life on Earth begins with putting the Arctic Ocean in quarantine. Scientists affirm what indigenous elders already knew. The oldest and thickest ice in the Arctic Ocean has declined by a stunning 95%. Every second, 14,000 tons more Arctic ice melts into the ocean, threatening our survival. How much longer will we wait? How much bigger do we need to be? Pulitzer Prize winning Harvard biologist Edward O. Wilson says, We must protect half of the planet to prevent mass extinction. Over 20,000 scientists from almost every country around the world have warned humanity in an open letter to immediately change our ways. The problem we face today is huge. But there is an effective, practical, and immediate response. MAPS, the Marine Arctic Peace Sanctuary, protects all life by safeguarding the entire Arctic Ocean north of the Arctic Circle. It acts on our interconnection to stop the exploitation that puts us at risk. In white here is MAPS, the largest marine protected area ever at 8 million square kilometers. It is like a medical mask for our world. With a single initiative, MAPS supports almost every United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. We realize MAPS in three key ways through government acceleration, grassroots empowerment, global activation. To realize MAPS, we need to update the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So we created the MAPS Treaty, translated it into six official languages of the United Nations, and gave it to all 193 member states. It enters into force when 99 countries sign on. We are in regular contact with world leaders to secure treaty signatures. Here you see the Prime Minister of Samoa and the Cook Islands have already signed the MAPS Treaty. They know their countries are sinking and we need MAPS now. Ivo de Bois, former Executive Secretary to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, has said MAPS is the only sane choice for the critically vulnerable Arctic ecosystem for the sake of our seas, our atmosphere and all life. 
governments act when people demand for change. Our petition and letter writing campaigns help you hold them accountable for maps. Our volunteer team and allies are growing worldwide from Australia to Zimbabwe. But grassroots activism and the United Nations take time. Time we don't have. How do we protect all life quickly? As Albert Einstein said, a new type of thinking is essential if mankind is to survive and move towards higher levels. When poverty returned from the North Pole, she was still moved by the dream of the well, acutely aware of our interconnection and the need to help the world awaken to it. She told her team, when we understand that we are all connected, we cannot harm because to do so would hurt ourselves and all life. She knew that to respond effectively to our current crisis, we need to address not just its symptoms but the underlying issue. James Gustav Steff, co-founder of the Natural Resource Defense Council, explains why an ecological approach is not enough. I used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse and climate change, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a cultural transformation. The catastrophic situations in the Arctic Ocean and our world are symptoms of a deeper problem. We have lost touch with our inherent interconnection. The indigenous Arctic elder known as Uncle says, we need to melt the ice in the heart of man if man is to stand a chance. So, Poverty Foundation has created GEM, Global Education for Maps, to do just that. GEM is music, yoga, words, TV, web and events that reawaken interconnection to activate social change. Part of the written content of GEM is the free Poverty Magazine you see here at povertymagazine.com as well as five upcoming self-help and nine young adult fiction books. Since Inner Peace is the foundation of world peace, as part of GEM, we also have an online workshop called Finding Your Inner Peace Sanctuary at Poverty.org. Also, at Poverty.world, you will find calming practices, inspiring music and more to support your health at all levels. We are reaching millions with a positive and inspiring message of maps through our Yogis Unite campaign. Find out more at yogisunitemaps.org. Coming soon to radio waves and video streams everywhere is Ocean Anthem, a pop album dedicated to our world's great waters, the first of seven albums of music for maps. Thanks to our global activation through GEM, working in conjunction with grassroots empowerment and government acceleration, MAPS has become an unstoppable worldwide movement with representation in 24 countries, international law in the making, 49 coalition partners including Jen Goddard Foundation and Sylvia Al's Mission Blue, growing youth initiatives and multiple inspiring campaigns unfolding. We understand that we are all connected. We feel I am Ocean Anthem, I am Maps, I am the world. Out of compassion, we courageously protect all life with Maps. Every day, as many as 200 species disappear forever. Two billion people in our world don't have enough to eat today, risking malnutrition and poor health. The World Bank estimates that in 2013, 1.6 billion people were living in countries and regions with absolute water scarcity, and the number is expected to rise to 2.8 billion people by 2025. But the most important thing to remember is that we can act for positive change. We can alter the direction we are going. This is what MAPS is giving us. The sooner we act, the more lives we save, including our own. So how do we take action? First, education. Please use all the free resources available to use at poverty.org, poverty.world, povertymagazine.com, and yogisunitemaps.org. Social media updates are posted daily. For activation, sign our MAPS petition. Pick up your phone and go to poverty.org where you'll see the petition on the front page. Now scroll down to where it says sign the MAPS petition and fill in your details. First and last name, email, city, country, postal code. This is the information needed to ensure petitions are legitimate and we keep it secure. So please take a moment now to sign and you've already taken action to support a healthy world. 
A voice for maps is a vote for interconnection. You can also get involved like I did and become a MAPS ambassador. I've met lots of like-minded people and we have fun as we protect all life. All you have to do is go to poverty.org forward slash youth. Beyond these practical steps, take a moment to think of the ways you are interconnected. Through the air you breathe that is shared with every living being on the planet, through the people you know and those who know them in turn through the dreams you share with even those you don't know. Remember, you are a drop of water perfectly carried by the ocean of life. There has been a never better time for courage that recognizes our inherent interconnection and action that arises out of compassion for all. MAPS is not only a boundary that protects nature, nor is it just a boundary that protects the fate of humanity. MAPS redefines our values to support the collective good. When you understand that the Arctic Ocean protects us all, MAPS makes the whole world our sanctuary. Thank you for being here to share in the power of interconnection and the opportunity that MAPS gives us for a peaceful and a healthy world. Thank you so much for that, Abigail. That was really engaging and we, we loved hearing from you. I particularly liked right at the start of your speech you said about the world being interconnected. And, and me and Mana were really enjoying that. And we're just having a conversation about it, actually. And we feel like the pandemic has really illustrated the way that the world is interconnected. We've seen how countries have a direct impact on each other and how everybody tries to come together in a time of need. Hopefully, that's the idea. Um, Mana, do you want to add to that, the conversation we were just having? Yeah, no, for sure. I think it really, just as you said, we really know that how connected we are all from all parts of the world because we started to understand what really goes into the supply chain. Like we're really reliant on China for certain things. Is that right? Maybe we can look more towards a self-sufficient world in the long future. So there's a lot to think about through that interconnectedness and how do we want to progress with this interconnectivity we have at the moment. But yeah, I think next off, we want to go on to Ariane Bajpai, Hi, excuse me. So Ariane is 20 years old and is pursuing an undergraduate degree from Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Sciences um, Tuli Jaipur, India, excuse me. He is an environmental enthusiast and also a member of Fridays for Future, Lucknow Local Branch and Indian Youth Climate Network. So I'm really happy to introduce you to Ariane. So Let's, shall we watch the video now then? Yeah, that would be a great idea. And Aaron is also talking about climate justice and he is confirmed in our panel on two days, in two days time. So make sure you get those questions going. Uh, we might forget to remind you about speakers who are going to be on the panel. Um, so maybe take this as like your, your reminder that uh, you should check who's going to be on the panel in two days time. And if it's the speaker that's about to come on, start having those questions. So yeah, like you said, over, over to watch the video. Good everyone. My name is Aaron Majpai and I'm from India. I'm an undergrad student and today I will be speaking for the mock of 26. Uh, I hope you all may find something, you learn something inter interesting as this is an important topic which has been ignored uh, by the academia and the policy making sector. And I hope uh, some action will be taken uh, post the mock of 26. So I'll just share my screen to share the presentation I have made. So uh, let's start. Mm, this is an image from a very famous Pixar movie. One of uh, the movies that actually got me into the uh, sector of environment and climate change. I always start all of my presentations with this, uh, with this screenshot of that from that movie. Towards the end, I will be telling which movie I've taken the screenshot from. So let's talk about climate change. You may have heard it in the form of art, in the form of protests, in the form of debates, in the in actual natural disasters, in the form of songs, and even this famous clock, which actually tells us how much time do we have left before uh, before we can take any action. And we also have the solutions such as the solar energy, the wind energy, sustainable fashion, sustainable agriculture. Some countries such as Netherlands have built walls to stop, uh, to prevent uh, rising sea levels. 
and uh, the normal uh, ways such as planting trees and protecting our natural habitat. But today I will be talking about migration due to climate crisis in South Asia, something which is comes under the realm of common sensical knowledge, but still has been ignored, especially by the governments. Climate migration is a very old phenomenon where people have been migrating from places to adapt to the to their environment or maybe escape from it. Some examples include snowstorms, blizzards, volcano eruptions, earthquakes, etc. It's an old phenomenon. It is nothing new. Uh, but our leaders have don't think climate change is exactly real, and uh, which is which is not because they lack knowledge, but because it does not serve their interests. And it is time that we tell them mm, to take these issues as important. So this is from a report of, from IDMC. You can see the name of the organization on the right uh, right bottom corner. This is a report which says the total number of displacements specifically in 2019, which took place due to conflicts and due to disasters. Now, if you see very closely, you can see that almost three fourth. I'm sorry, almost three fourth of the displacements have taken place due to climate change factors. Uh, these include geo geophysical reasons like earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, and other include weather-related events such as storms, wildfires, droughts, floods, extreme temperatures, etc. And among these events, you can see most of these displacements happen in, in South Asia, where countries like India, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, these all are states. Uh, they, they constitute the world's maximum amount of displacements. This is due to the factor that these are the developing countries who do not have enough adaptation and mitigation strategies. And at the same time, these are the ones which are most vulnerable to climate change impacts. Uh, the disasters happen in the form of land degradation, desertification, rising sea levels, cyclones and floods, and due to uh, and due to other factors. As you can see, the, these three, uh, the, the three disasters which are located on the left hand of the side of the screen are called as the slow onset disasters, which happen in a period of about months or even years. On the other hand, things like cyclones and floods happen in a very short span of time. And these are called as the, small, the extreme event. Now, the report which I showed you earlier only and only considers the, uh, the extreme events which happens within a period of a day or maximum of a week. The reports do not consider the slow onset events such as rising sea levels or desertification which are increasingly becoming a problem. They are not considered because they are hard to measure and climate migration is a very complex issue and does not involve like and what's a complex um, and a huge range of factors such as economic factors, social political factors, etc. It is hard to divide to segregate the importance of climate from the other factors. Uh, the Global Climate Risk Index, which is the German Watch, an organization, says the South Asia is one of the most vulnerable uh, regions to the climate crisis. Uh, so this is how it happens in most of the South Asia. The climate crisis affects agriculture, which is one of the most predominantly in like income uh, job uh, income producing jobs which people do in this region. Uh, more than seventy, more than half of the population in all of South Asian countries resides in agriculture. The, the climate crisis affects agriculture in the form of heat waves, abnormal temperature, abnormal rainfalls, uh, desertification, etc. Coupled along with that, you have poor governance, lack of job security, and low income. Many and many people are leaving agriculture as we talk. The average age of a farmer in the region has increased up to around 55 to 65. And this raises two simple questions. Who will be growing our food in the near future if Agriculture is not an important job. And where will the people who are, uh, who are exiting the agriculture field go? These people who leave the agriculture field migrate to cities or urban centers. These people then work in informal sectors, which again actually emit emissions. 
For example, a person who is leaving agriculture in India will, will go to an urban center where he will work in a brick kiln or for relatable places. This is a brick kiln or mining activities themselves are a form of emission. And hence they contribute to climate crisis. And hence the whole cycle continues. This question has been, have been asked by the government in India. Uh, as you can see, this question pertains, uh, pertains to a question asked by a minister in the Lok Sabha, which is the, uh, which is the place where laws are made in India in simple language. And uh, as you can see, the government has easily said that they don't have any data re related to that. They identify features such as industry and services, increasing urbanization and low income in agriculture, but they do not provide any solutions. The decline of agriculture in the region is one of the most important contributors to migration in the place. As you can see, the, the government, the, uh, the central government just shifts the responsibility from the central to the state government. Uh, with, relate to, with relation to climate change, a more uh, direct question which has been asked with direct reference to the climate migrants has been also asked in the Indian Lok Sabha. But again, no, no such data available was the answer given to the, the person who has asked the question. Countries which have been suffering from climate migration from a long time, such as Bangladesh, have on the other hand already included climate migration as an important part of the National Adaptation Program of Action and their Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan. And, and this has been done back in 2005 and 2009. So you can assume that the effects of climate, the effects of climate change have been important to the country since a very long time. According to Oli Brown, author of the International Organization for Migration, he says, so far there is no room for climate migrants in the international community, both literally and figuratively. This is because of a variety of reasons which I'll discuss in uh, just uh, in a few moments. The, the climate migration is generally seen as, from a safe state security focus, which actually focuses just on the resources available to a state. It is not a wrong, it is wrong for a, a multi multitude of reasons. First, this assumes, this narrative assumes that most of the migration which takes place happens across borders, which is not the case. The majority of the migration which takes place due to climate induced factors happens within the borders. The states want to avoid the responsibility and want to shift the focus to the other country, which is why they say that this is a problem should, uh, uh, in which they should increase the border security, which is not the answer. For example, uh, for example India built a wall uh, on the India-Bangladesh border to, in, to prevent the migrants from coming into the country, which is not the solution, because climate change is a, is a, is a thing which affects multi, multiple countries. It does not limit to a, a specific border, and this the countries have to realize. So what, do we, uh, so what should we call them? Environmental refugees, climate migrants, displaced person, environmental migrants, or climate refugees? There's a lot of terms, but they, among these only two terms are correct, and the international community nowadays only consider one term correct. Environmental migrants. Uh, the reason why we cannot call them refugees is because the term refugees is not identified by the international, in, by the international law. And this prevents them under, and this prevents the countries from taking up responsibility again. Hence, IOM, which is the International Organization for Migration, defines environmental migrants as persons or group of persons uh, who, for reasons of sudden or progressive changes in the environment that adversely affect their lives or living conditions, are obliged to leave their homes or choose to do so, either temporarily or permanently, and who move either within their country or abroad. Be careful to use the term environmental migrants rather than using the term refugees. Again, because refugees are not identified by the international law. As you can see in this map from the South Asia, the arrows signify the, the paths of migration from important cities in the in the especially in India, ranging from Nepal and Bangladesh. Since there is a lot of security between the Pakistan India border. No such path has been identified, but they have been assumed that there are several paths between Afghanistan to Pakistan. All of these countries severely are affected by climate change impacts. As you can see, uh, the red line indicates the decline of the Himalayan regions. 
uh, this line in the second line indicates the decline of the coastal regions. The deserts are also uh, the desertification is increasing in the west part of the South Asian region, and the middle part is engulfed by illegal mining activities. As you as you may know that South Asia is home to approximately a billion people, and the population is increasing rapidly. So, in such a case, with, uh, with the Himalayas declining and the coastal region becoming destabilized, along with rising sea levels in countries like Sri Lanka and Maldives, I, um, I don't particularly see a lot of space left for a population as large as South Asia. And hence, this calls for an immediate action. And I am not um, um, making jokes about any of this. These are the reports which actually prove the evidence for the uh, previously given uh, map of the South Asia. As you can see, uh, the Himalayas are losing ice along with the desertification increasing in the country, in the, in the region. So I will now explain how actually migration takes place and how it can happen in when it comes to the rural areas. There are factors which may cause migration in the first place, such as climate induced disasters. There are factors which may lead to degradation after migration. For example, people go to a place. They use of the resources extensively without giving the resources enough time to grow back, which will, which will lead to degradation in the first place. There are other factors which may push people in the affected places. For example, let's consider a city in eastern India named Kolkata. If a cyclone strikes that place, people will leave it. But again, that will give them the um, but that region will have opportunity for infrastructure development. That means more jobs. More jobs means more money. And hence, people will go to that area to earn money. Hence, there are different factors. It is not always the case that people will migrate away from the place, but then uh, there might be sometimes when they go to the place where the climate change has, uh, climate change as well has impacted. Now, coming to the rural areas, if you can see this infographic, you can easily say, you can easily uh, see uh, that rural individual characteristics, such as the rural urban migration, rural rural migration happens. It may, uh, it may lead to job avail availability. In, uh, the job availability is an important reason why migration happens to the rural urban area. Rural rural migration happens because, for example, if a, if a place has poor soil quality, people will move out to another place. But since they only know agriculture as a form of job, they will prefer to move to a rural area where they can again uh, take agriculture as an, another, another activity. Again, uh, other factors include why actually the people migrate in the first place, whether it is the poor quality, such as uh, whether it is a negative reason, such as decrease in soil quality, yields, water contamination, etc., or whether is it uh, is it because of positive reasons, such as government and NGO policies uh, and extension services, etc. Hence, it is important. Hence, again, I will mention this that migration is a complex issue. And there are several factors which may influence a person moving in or out of the place. Migration, uh, climate change affects different sectors of population differently. Among the worst hit are the people of a minority religion, uh, people from um, by minority caste, uh, women, uh, women and people from the LGBTQ community, the people who have low income, etc. As you can see, these are the some reports, uh, some media reports which have been taken, uh, which have which which can tell that climate change has different impacts all over the region. Uh, for example, uh, for example, consider these red dots again from the map. Climate change also can also lead to other uh, other human rights issues such as trafficking. For example, there have been reports. From uh, there have been reports uh, where, which say that when a particular place is impacted by a climate crisis, people tend to get their girls married fast. Why is that? Because people think that since uh, since if the girls get married, they will become the responsibility of other families due to the existing patriarchal culture, and hence they won't have to spend enough money on their own daughters because they will become uh, because they will become a part of someone else's family. Hence, child marriage is also an important uh, is a is a is a result of climate induced disasters. Trafficking may also happen due to such factors. For example, if a place gets hit by climate disaster, then people will migrate and become vulnerable to trafficking because they will be in search of jobs. They can be easily manipulated. 
because they need money and hence they get trapped in the in the web of trafficking the red uh, the red dots signify the major trafficking destination of you know, places in south asia and here is uh, uh, here is where i end my presentation climate uh, as an ending note climate migration is a complex issue and affects and is affecting millions of people in south asia uh, action uh, um, action is needed from both the research side and from the policy making side along with civil along with the formation of civil society organizations which actually which actually promote this uh, which actually which actually talk about this topic which is uh, which is becoming important uh, thank you yeah thank you so much for that video you you know so much about the topic and your slides and all of the effort that you've put into that was was amazing um, we really appreciate having those insights that, that you've been able to give us um, thank you so much um, <laughs> I think I'm introducing the next person aren't I Mana? yes you are perfect I'm just going to try and get their name up uh, yes so next up we've got Stella and I'm really not very good at pronouncing names or words in fact language isn't really my forte so I'm actually not going to say your last name because I don't want to get it wrong but this is Stella um, Stella has got a PhD. She's a 31 year old scientist uh, for Future from Kenya. She is the founder and CEO of LOABOWA Limited, where they consult on climate resilience, among other things, for climate resilient livelihoods, enabling adaptive capacity is fundamental. It entails ingenuity, awareness, creation, microgrids, etc. They also seek climate friendships for better collaboration and advocacy on climate governance. As a climate expressionist, her contribution to these friendships is a sub-Saharan one. She also volunteers with COP, non-official Mother Earth Project, a coalition of African activists, as a strategist. Finally, she, is, she has had the honour of holding leadership positions. So we really look forward to hearing from you, Stella. And Stella is talking about climate resilient livelihoods, which is the next topic that we're going to be looking at in this session. So over to you, Stella. Hi everybody. My name is Stella Nyaburabao. I'm from Nairobi, Kenya. And for my presentation on climate resilient livelihoods, I thought it best to start with a background in climate resilience. So I'm going to be sharing my slides quite a lot. So this will be founded on the climate resilience theory. Then I'll use that theory to contextualize climate resilient livelihoods. The climate resilience theory takes a precautionary approach. It's about risk reduction. That is, climate change presents risks, and it's important to respond to them in a way that reduces suffering. I'll go ahead to briefly define each of its four indicators, that is, climate change, adaptation, vulnerability, and resilience. Climate change is a change in climate brought about by global warming that has caused a shift in climate systems. This then triggers extreme weather events like wildfires, floods, and droughts. Adaptation, on the other hand, means reducing vulnerability to climate change. This is by introducing or installing new coping mechanisms. At this point, I'd like to mention maladaptation which is an unsuccessful un adaptation. So even as adaptations are used, it's important to explore the potential negative consequences in order to avoid increased vulnerability in future, because adaptation has one job, to reduce vulnerability. Are we facing climate change with or without adaptation? This brings me to vulnerability versus resilience. Vulnerability is the degree to which a thing, system, community is not able to recover from a climate event, usually due to a lack in adaptation, which is a reality for most vulnerable communities. And where there is reduced vulnerability, there is increased resilience. So what is resilience? This is the ability to bounce back into shape after an event to absorb the shock and maintain function. 
At this point, I'd also like to mention transformation. It refers to the opportunity to bounce back to a desired state. Much like the conversation around post-COVID-19 and building back better to a different, greener, new normal better. Now we can move to climate resilient livelihoods. Going by the definition just given for climate resilience, a climate resilient livelihood means a livelihood that has the ability to bounce back into shape after a climate event. A livelihood in itself is a set of activities through which we meet our needs. That is, how do we get food, water, Examples are the communities that depend on fishing or agriculture. These are referred to as primary activities, while those in urban areas depend on manufacturing, others on services, which are referred to as secondary activities. Let's switch back to slides. So let's contextualize this in the theory I presented earlier. Firstly, with regard to climate change, the most prevalent climate risks are floods, droughts, and sea level rise. These are already being experienced in many parts of the world. With that as it may, some parts of the world are more vulnerable than others. Secondly, with regard to adaptation, the extent to which a thing, system, community needs to adapt is subject to its vulnerability. How do we know how vulnerable we are? The answer is that there's a tool, the Livelihood Vulnerability Index. It enables you to assess the impact of climate change on livelihoods. Vulnerability is a function of how much a community is exposed, sensitive, and able to adapt to climate change. Each of these indicators can be measured this way letting you know where the gaps that need to be addressed are. Results of such an assessment have implications on where stakeholders direct their adaptation efforts with their monies, so that limited resources are channeled to areas where they are needed the most. I'll explore this idea of climate resilient livelihoods further using these two scenarios farming livelihoods and coastal livelihoods. I'll start with the farming livelihoods. The impact of drought and flood cycles is usually fast felt in agriculture. These risks particularly affect Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, where livelihoods and ecosystems are highly sensitive to changes in climate. Agriculture, especially in Africa, is mainly rain-fed, so drought and flood cycles are very disruptive. Also, farming is heavily dependent on family labor. So bad health in one or more family members could affect food production. So with more and more events on the offing, these communities are getting more and more locked into poverty. But before recommending adaptation measures to address these vulnerabilities, it's important to understand the gaps, which is where the livelihoods vulnerability index comes in. I'll give an example. Back to the slide. To recommend adaptation measures for two rural regions in Ghana, Wenchi and Tachuman, I hope I pronounced those right, uh, a livelihood vulnerability index assessment was carried out. Farmers from these two areas mostly farm maize, and after tallying scores using the livelihood vulnerability index, uh, which I'm sure you can't see, but I still will draw your attention to the right side of the chat, when she was found to have a higher vulnerability. The following recommendations were made to reduce this. There was a need to build more community health centers, also for the drilling of bubbles to access water. So the sensitivities addressed here are when she's access to health and water resources, as you will call from the Livelihood Vulnerabilities Index. 
the farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia could adapt to uh, climate change and climate risks by implementing adaptation measures such as firstly climate smart technologies in order to increase crop yield uh, using seed bulbs, for example, as used in arid areas of, uh, of, of Kenya, not Africa, uh, where seeds are dispersed with not so much regard for when the rains will come. The idea is to disperse them and whenever the rains come, the seed will pick it up from them. Secondly, diversification of livelihoods by getting involved in on and off farm activities. An example from Bangladesh, the diversification of things you could farm all at once. A response to floods is where farmers have adopted to a model that integrates fish, fruit, vegetables, and dark farming all in one. It's done using floating farms. So when storms come, the farms rise with the rising sea and farmers don't lose much of their produce. Finally, an unpopular adaptation measure, migration is a good thing. That's Lewis Hamilton's jersey said that. When soils lose their productivity, leading to the lack of food, people may be left with no other option but to move through no fault of their own to find other places that could better support them. Um, I'd like to give an example from Kenya that shows how to respond to vulnerabilities using community specific solutions. So our group, pastoral communities are allowed to pay their national health insurance fund contributions in the form of goats. I really mean goats. This way they're able to access insurance which reduces their vulnerability. Some conditions that discourage the adoption of these adaptive measures in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia include limited information, poor access to services, ICT infrastructure, poverty, conflicts, I guess mostly African, inadequate access to health facilities, and other many reasons. Finally, cases of maladaptation to look out for are, for example, when communities look to selling firewood and charcoal production as adaptation measures. These are maladaptive and could lead to even more vulnerability in future because it means deforestation and that has heavy negative implications in the long run. The second scenario I'd like to look at is coastal livelihoods. Coastlines are threatened by flooding from coastal storms, coastal erosion, oil spills, most recent Mauritius case, sea level rise, which causes salt intrusion on agricultural land. A good example of that is Myanmar, which is one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change and sea level rise. But there are fishing livelihoods as well. Freshwater fish populations are rapidly declining because climate change is altering the timing of migration and spawning. So to adapt to these coastal challenges, some strategies include my mangrove, uh, which are salt tolerant and can withstand harsh coastal conditions, as well as biogenic foods. In one of the adaptation experiments in France, coastal retreat was considered an adaptation. For coastal communities, it's challenging to consider this a solution, but the framing around sea level rise as a global issue rather than a local one, uh, the conversation around relocation became one that could be had. This points to the need for community engagement and creating awareness. And uh, the potential for that communication space is to, to change perceptions is, is huge. Back to
to line this up, I'll give the conclusions and recommendations, one of each. One of the conclusions is that creating awareness, education and training help reduce vulnerability because you know, our father knows that in September, I shouldn't plant because the rains don't have to come in September as I'm used to. Um, you know, that saves them from losing the seed and you know, helps with decision making. One of the recommendations as well is that adaptation policies should accommodate migration as an adaptation measure. Uh, the other recommendations are, you know, we want to have a limited role in disaster management and um, to use disaster, disaster risk governance would allow for their voices to be heard, not just women, also other minority groups. So with that said, thank you for listening, stay healthy and bye for now. All right, Stella, thank you so much for your interesting comments about the fact that you know, sea level is rising and we really need to understand what are the coastal challenges that are facing people all around the world. And that method of adaptation to be implemented really into the policies of the future because migration is such a large thing already happening and it's just going to increase tremendously as we go. So actually I would like to introduce the next speaker who's David Watson Mubali, excuse me for my pronunciation. Um, Mubali is a professional economist and climate change activist. He is a former change maker at the African Leadership Institute, a Gates Foundation goalkeeper and Mandela Washington fellow with three years experience in social enterprise development and development economics. He is an award-winning social entrepreneur, founder of Fourth Line Zambia, winner of the 2019 UN Environment Seed Award for the most climate smart and equal inclusive enterprise in Africa. 2019 Goalkeepers Youth Action Award by the Gates Foundation, 2019 Mandela Washington Fellowship Business Plan Award, and the 2020 Zambia National Youth Awards Entrepreneur of the Year. So David will be talking about the climate resilient livelihoods and I'd like to start the video off. Once in an era, a lifetime, perhaps a generation, an idea so bold is born that it changes on how people look at the world. When Galilei Galilei first stated that the earth was spherical, spinning on its axis and rotating around the sun, he was arrested for preaching false propaganda. Hello. My name is David Watson Mwavila. I'm an economist, social entrepreneur, and climate change activist. Rural and small-scale farming communities in sub-Saharan Africa are the hardest hit by climate change. Here, communities are trapped in absolute poverty and underemployment as they begin to lose their jobs and sources of livelihood in the rain-fed sectors of the local economies. As a result, many of the youths and women have, resort, have resorted to cutting down trees and producing charcoal as a source of livelihood. This, however, has serious environmental consequences and accelerates the situation even further. Climate change, biodiversity preservation, and environmental emergencies are the defining issues of our age. As a young innovator living in the front lines of communities badly affected by climate change, my voice as a climate activist serves as an important role in influencing global climate policy. Despite following closely over the years debates on climate change, in 2018 I was faced with something I never imagined would happen in my lifetime. The well that my grandmother dug 35 years ago as a source of water for our family and our livestock rain dry. The rains were nowhere to be seen despite it being the rainy season and poverty and hunger ravaged on the community like a plague. Those images still haunt me today as I speak. 
the climate is changing faster than our efforts to address it. The alarm bells keep ringing, even as we march year in and year out during the UN Climate Summit. A lot needs to be done. As our cries fell on deaf ears, you and me are faced with one sad reality. We have to adopt to the effects and impact of climate change. This will enhance and accelerate steps in building of the different adaptive capacities, thereby enabling communities to live with the uncertainties and the risks that climate change poses. This, for this to happen, it will take unprecedented partnerships and collective reimaginations of how our different pieces of society fit together and must fit together to work for the benefit of us all. We have to work together as a global community to take action before it's too late. As quoted in one of President Obama's famous speeches to the UN in 2014, we cannot and we will not condemn generations after us to a future that is beyond their capacity to repair. Not when we have the scientific imaginations to do so and the technological innovations that can serve as a valuable asset in uh, addressing climate change. As an innovator, I believe that focusing on building resilience, supporting climate smart jobs, and fostering more intentional and equitable growth lies at the center of the global decade of action. This is one of the many ways we can ensure that we can achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals without leaving anyone behind. Thank you. Thank you so, so much for that, David. It was such a powerful speech. Um, I actually made a few notes on that one. Um, there were th three things you said that were really impactful for me. You said the climate is changing faster than our efforts to address it. And I think that sums this whole thing up so well and, and why mock -cop is happening. You also said we have to work together as a global community to take action before it is too late. And again, that is such a powerful statement. And, and then lastly, it was it was that really personal story when you talked about the images still haunting you. And I think it's really important that we remember the, the human cost that climate change has. And I thank you so much for the addressing that and for talking about it so openly. So thank you so much, David. Uh, next, we're going to hear from uh, Teach the Future. And Teach the Future is a youth-led campaign to urgently repurpose the entire education system around the climate emergency and the ecological crisis. It is based in the UK and is hosted by SOS UK, which is the same charity which is hosting MockCop. So it's going to be great to hear from them and sort of look at how the education system that this campaign to change the education system in the UK might be able to be applied to to other countries um, because education is a key aspect of, of mock cop mm -hmm. so they're going to be talking about climate education which I, I suppose was probably fairly evident from the, <laughs> the introduction I gave um, so over to them Cheats the Future is a campaign that was set up in October of 2019 by the UK Student Climate Network and Students Organising for Sustainability UK, with an aim of calling on the government to rapidly repurpose the education system around the climate crisis and ecological emergency, to better prepare young people and students to be able to mitigate and face the consequences of such a catastrophe. We ask that the teaching of sustainability in the environment is liberated from its current subject of geography and the sciences, instead being woven like a golden thread through every available subject, as we recognise that the climate crisis is indiscriminate and therefore is no longer adequate for only a selection of students to be taught about this. Teach the Future works under three core asks for the governments of the United Kingdom and two additional asks for Scotland and Wales. The three core asks are one, a review into how the education system is currently preparing young people for the climate crisis, two, inclusion of the climate crisis in teacher training and the creation of a national professional qualification, and three, the enactment of an English Climate Emergency Education Act, a Scottish Climate and Biodiversity Emergency Education Act, and a Welsh Climate Emergency Education Act. In addition, in Wales, 
We also specifically call for sustainable schools whereby all new and existing educational buildings are built or retrofitted to carbon neutral standard and for the adoption of sustainable practices across the education sector. In Scotland, we also call for increased priority of the climate crisis in Scottish school inspection and educational institute rankings. In the UK, the education system means that climate change is actually very limited to very specific subjects, geography and the three sciences. However, not everyone is very scientifically inclined and so it kind of cuts off people from learning about climate change and being interested in it. Um, and so we need to kind of take away those barriers and climate change shouldn't be an optional topic. Instead, it should be a compulsory one because every young person has to prepare to go through a contemporary schooling system, which will prepare them for their entry into green industry. Because whether you're a builder or a banker, a farmer or a pharmacist, you will be affected by the climate emergency. So do you not deserve the right to learn about what you can do to prevent it? So this could come in the form of overt teaching on topics like colonialism and how the effects of the climate crisis will disproportionately affect those in the global south, in history or the effects of animal agriculture in food technology, or on a more subconscious scale um, in mathematics, for example, where you could learn about problem solving, but using examples, real life examples, to do with how the climate crisis is going to start affecting us. So why is Teach the Future necessary? Well, millions of students throughout the UK have never had climate change mentioned in their education. And, if they have, it may have been siloed into one or two subjects. So, for example, I learned about it in geography, but I had to choose that subject in order to learn about the topic. A little bit to back that up. Research commissioned by the UK Student Climate Network in conjunction with Oxfam and the National Union of Students found that 4% of students said that they know a lot about climate change in England. Also in England, 68% of students said that they wished to learn more about their environment in schools. However, 75% of teachers UK-wide said that they don't feel adequately trained to teach their students about the climate emergency and the ecological crisis. But it's not just about whether or not it's taught, it's about how the teaching is delivered. We're seeing an all too common trend. Those who are being educated about the climate, a very small minority, are not being given enough of a comprehensive look into the, the emergency that they are going to be inheriting. Students are not taught about how those in the global south are being disproportionately impacted, about how climate change has deep historical roots to imperialism and colonialism, and about the many more global issues that have come about due to the neglect of this crisis. This is why we must teach the future. In 2019, when Teach the Future launched, we held a parliamentary reception where we gained the support of many members of the House, as well as launching our Teach the Future Bill, the first bill ever written by students in the UK that lays out how we want education around the climate crisis to become an integral part of our curriculum. We also laid out the costings for how we want our education buildings to achieve net zero by 2030. We've also gained the support of many high level, level officials such as Rebecca Long Bailey, Ed Miliband, John Sweeney and Michelle Donnellon. As part of a green recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, we've also helped push for £1 billion in funding for, public, for uh, public buildings to achieve carbon neutrality. At Teach the Future, we are always looking for more people to get involved in our campaign and strengthen our movement and there are so many ways in which you can do so. If there is already a branch of our campaign in your nation, we love for you to join us. To become a volunteer, you can sign up on our website by filling out the form on our volunteer page. If there is not a pre-existing branch in your nation, it would be amazing if our campaign could spread across the globe and for you to start a new branch of Teach the Future. We are offering support to all new climate education campaigns launching in 2021 with Teach the Future UK's International Working Group. Another way to get involved is by contacting your local representative and asking them to fulfil Teach the Future's asks. You can also sign up to our Action Work Network to hear more about what we are currently working on and to find more opportunities to get involved in our campaign.
If you are part of an organisation which is supportive of our campaign, we have a growing number of supporting organisations and we would love for you to sign up and become part of our community. You can find out more about Teach the Future via our website www.teachthefuture.uk where you can sign up for our newsletter or blog. Feel free to check out our Instagram at ttf.scot or ttf.wales or our Twitter at teachthefuture. Alternatively, we'd love to hear from you via email at our email hello at teachthefuture.uk or international at teachthefuture.uk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teach the Future, for your lovely speech. It's really informative to know about how much effort you guys have put into uh, spreading climate education in the UK and hopefully more into the globally on a global scale because that's what we really need. We really need to prepare the youth and also the adults as to how to better understand what's happening in our global context. So really, I hope this will spread towards um, a bigger scale as well. And next off, we actually have Julian Lokirlo. And Julian is one of Denmark's youth delegates to the UN for Climate and Environment and coordinator for the Global Youth Biodiversity Network Europe. Uh, Julian is co-founder and former chairman of Students Organization, Organizing for Sustainability International, as well as former executive committee member at the National Uni Union of Students in Denmark and former board member at the European Students Union. In 2012, Julian was nominated to the Young European of the Year Award and he will be talking about the importance of thinking climate and environment into the education system as a whole and not only in curriculums. So Julian will be talking about climate education as notified and what was talked prior, but I think we shall start the video now. Dear mock-up 26 delegates and fellow young activists, we're in the middle of a climate and biodiversity crisis and probably this is the greatest challenge we humans have ever faced in our time on this planet. The task ahead is huge, and we will only succeed in avoiding disaster if all sectors of society work together towards carbon neutral societies that live in harmony with nature. Education plays a key role in this task, not only because it shapes the values, the knowledge, and the skills of the upcoming generation, but also because as the current pandemic has taught us, Education institutions play a key social role in our communities, a role that goes well beyond teaching and learning. Among many other things, schools provide everyday food for millions of children across the world. Education institutions build bridges across families and local communities. They inform parents on aspects that they did not have previous knowledge on, and they produce the scientific research that defines what we know as human beings. The transition towards a truly sustainable education system is not only about including more environmental topics in the curricula, but it's also about including climate and biodiversity in all aspects of education and in all sectors of our education institutions. If we do not do so, we will only be doing half of the task and half-hearted solutions are not sufficient in the middle of this crisis. Our approach towards sustainable education system needs to have Three needs to focus on three key elements. The first one is about education and research. We must include climate and biodiversity in education curricula across all relevant subjects and at all levels from primary to higher education. Schools and universities should teach about the science behind climate change and mass extinction of species. As well, they should teach about the social, economical and ethical aspect behind those phenomena how it affects people differently and the reasons behind it, and how we can promote solutions that also promote social justice. We need an approach to environmental education that is science-based, multidisciplinary and intersectional. And it is extremely important that including these topics in curriculum, it is done through meaningful involvement of teachers and students in the decision-making processes. This is not only the most democratic way of doing so, but it's also the most effective one, as both teachers and students are everyday experts of the education system. When it comes to research, 
we need to direct the strategic efforts of academic institutions, as well as public and private investment, towards green research that supports the transition towards sustainable societies. But we should also, while always bearing the principles of academic freedom at the center, open up a discussion on the ethical issues of conducting certain types of research, which outcomes we know are going to be harmful for the present and future generations. We know more, than, more, than, more and better than before, and we should update our research policies accordingly. Research should always be in line with the principle of causing no harm. This is not an easy discussion to have, but it is a very important one. The second key element is that we need to make our education institutions sustainable. We need to ensure that schools and universities are managed in a way that is not harming for our planet. From energy consumption to the food that is served in school canteens, institutions should follow both principles of carbon neutrality and no harm towards nature. And that means changing the way we have been doing things up to now. This also includes university investment portfolios. Our institutions should not be investing in companies and projects that are directly harming our planet. This includes, for example, investments in fossil fuel companies. Education institutions should immediately divest from such portfolios and invest instead in real green solutions. Our schools and universities cannot teach about sustainability without striving towards being sustainable themselves. Institutions need to lead by example and they need to walk the talk. Finally, education institutions should actively work and engage their local communities. The way of doing so changes from context to context but examples of such action could be to proactively fight disinformation, to inform parents on environmental issues, to develop partnerships with green actors, or to promote democratic discussions on the importance of climate and biodiversity action. Education institutions play a fundamental role in our communities, a role that cannot be fulfilled by any other institution. They should use that role to be leaders of the green transition. But how do we achieve these goals? What is our role as young people? Well, our role is to put enough pressure on decision makers to make the necessary changes come into reality. This needs to be done at all levels, from a small local school at a rural area, all the way to the United Nations. And our action needs to be both within and outside the system. In the places where students and youth are represented, like in student unions or academic senates, we need to use our democratic tools to ensure that these topics are put at the center of the agenda. But that should not stop us from being active on the streets, especially when we are not represented in the decision-making processes. We must organize and fight together for the change we all need and the future we all deserve. If there's something that we have learned in this past year is that when we young people fight together, we are unstoppable. Thank you so much for your attention and have a great mock COP26. Thank you so much for that, Julian. It was great to have another take on climate education, which is as we, both, as we all know, like a really important part of engaging young people and of people understanding the need for action and understanding climate change. Um, it was really great to hear. I think we've got another speaker coming up. Yep, I think you're quite right. We have Daryl. Yeah. Introducing. Yeah. yeah, so Daryl Alvarez is the founder of Generations for Health a youth-led organisation that creates a space for horizontal exchange between youth and world health leaders to find solutions to current global health challenges and take into consideration the transformative power of the youth. Daryl has worked with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Spain, the delegation of the European Union to Cambodia, and has collaborated with UNICEF, Every Breath Counts, and has different national and international NGOs, uh, oh, sorry, and different national and international NGOs the protection and promotion of human rights. He is the former president of UNSA Spain, having developed diverse projects for the empowerment of youth at both national and international level, highlighting his project for the Global Forum on Childhood Pneumonia. He is currently doing a dual master degree in Asian and European affairs, focusing on the corporate co cooperation or development between both regions. Looking forward to hearing from you. Over to you. My name is Daryl Alvarez and I'm the founder of Generations for Health, a youth-led organization that wants to connect the youth with world health leaders in order to promote the creation of solutions that takes into account the transformative power of the youth, their opinions and decisions in global health matters. 
In the last couple of months, we have been focusing especially on the climate health nexus and planetary health. Climate change is one of the greatest threats of our times, affecting us and the planet at every level, and health is not an exception. Hundreds of thousands of lives are being lost every year due to climate change. The direct damage cost is estimated to be between two to four billion US dollars every year by 2030. Climate change has already affected access to safe drinking water, food security, clean air, and even other wet housing, and has changed the path of the infection patterns and their geographic location. Also, climate change is affecting all populations, certain populations in certain countries with weak health system infrastructures will be most affect, the most affected by it and won't be able to have the consequences of climate change without external support. That's why close cooperation between all actors is essential in order to be able to face the challenge that climate change poses to our health. Also, close cooperation has been promoted between governments, international organizations, NGOs, and even the private sector. There are almost no strategies that aim to promote an active role of the general public, and especially the younger generations. In the last decades, young people have shown greatest, greatest strength, creativity, and to demand action, and to ask for changes in their communities and create those changes and solutions. But sometimes the link with health is a little bit blurry. The right to health and the health sector can feel very distant and specialized for the general public, especially for younger generations, feeling, making them feel that they have no influence on, of power over it or to influence their decisions that are taken in that sector. But the truth is that they do have power and they do have the influence on those decisions. If there is something that the COVID-19 pandemic has clearly shown to us is that the right to health is not isolated. It's closely interconnected with other human rights, such as the right to education, the right to work, the right to non-discrimination, or even the right to access to food. All of us can have a role and should have a role in protecting the right to health under the current climate emergency. Developing a strategy at both local and global level that promote the participation of the general public, especially the younger generations that are going to be the ones taking the lead tomorrow and the ones most affected by the consequences, consequences of today's decision is pivotal in order to fight the current climate emergency and ensure the right to health for everyone. We need to make the health sector and the right to health more accessible to everyone. Each of us has the power to change the world, and we should never diminish the power that individuals have. In the fight against climate change and in the fight for the protection of the right to health, we need the involvement and the courage of each of us. Lovely. Uh, Daryl, thank you so much for your really informative comment about how it's really important to understand that the rights of health is really interconnected to the accessibility of these people um, based on even the gender and the age of these people. And that's something that everyone really needs to take into consideration more often. Uh, next off, I actually want to introduce Patrick Ryan Bello. He Rain, actually Rain, is a Filipino youth health advocate and climate activist. He is a climate reality leader trained in July 2020. He is the head secretary of Youth Strike for Climate Philippines, a national-led youth-led movement affiliated with various environmental and climate organizations. In the movement, he helps in raising the climate awareness of Filipino youth and empowering them to make climate action and demand for climate justice. He has helped in drafting the Youth De Declaration for Climate Justice, a set of youth demands pushing for climate change, adaptation, mitigation, and social justice. He has also helped in drafting the recommendations and commitments for the economy of Francesco in line with Pope Francis's call to take care of our common home. So this is a great opportunity to start the video for Patrick. Yeah, over to you, Patrick. Time is running out. 
the time to take climate action was actually decades ago when the problem was first identified and mainstream. But people did not listen. They did not listen because there is no scientific evidence or a lack of scientific backing, but because of how a specific corporation reframed the discussions on the climate crisis. They dismissed the findings of the researchers they employed and claimed that there is not much science behind it. They were also actively engaged in false propaganda, claiming that climate change is not real and their efforts was actually successful. Climate change was less talked about for years or even decades to come. Their country also did not sign the Kyoto Protocol because of this disinformation. As seconds pass by, as climate change intensifies, we are losing the opportunity to lessen climate crisis impacts on our environment, on people's livelihoods, and ultimately our own health. Not only does the climate change significantly affect individuals and communities, but it also disproportionately impacts marginalized sectors and vulnerable groups who generally do not have adequate resources and capacities to adapt and be resilient to the destruction brought upon by the climate crisis. I would like to emphasize that these groups contribute less to the climate crisis, and yet they are more heavily impacted by this global phenomenon. And talking about it on a more international scale, developing countries contribute less than more developed countries, and yet they remain to be less resilient to the climate crisis. So now we have a relatively more solid grasp on the climate crisis and its impacts because of much scientific evidence, especially through various reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or IPCC, and also through the narratives of impacted and affected communities. We can take these to promote climate adaptation in order to increase the climate resilience of vulnerable and marginalized communities. We also have innovations such as renewable energy, that is now increasing in affordability and availability. So there is a consensus between the World Health Organization and the Lancet. They both acknowledge that climate change is the greatest and biggest threat to global health in the 21st century, our current generation, our time right now. And there is a huge amount of evidence to back this up. And one of the main reasons are greenhouse gas or GHG emissions from fossil fuels and other human activities. Despite global commitment to climate change mitigation by relying less on fossil fuels, developing industries and innovations to serve as greener alternatives, and making and ensuring these alternatives are more accessible to a broader number of people, GHG emissions like carbon are still on the rise. And by the end of this year, we need more ambitious, nationally determined contributions from our governments towards climate change mitigation. Otherwise, the climate crisis will just keep on getting worse. We are already living in a moment wherein the climate crisis intensifies in the middle of health problems, especially and more notably the COVID-19 pandemic. It ushers in more health concerns and this continued rise in GHG emissions compounds on health problems and aggravates existing health conditions. The IPCC Special Report on Global Warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius shows that by 2030 to 2052, we might already reach an increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius beyond the years 1850 to 1900, should our emissions continue at this pace. And this will actually result in many adverse impacts. More emissions means more heat is trapped in our atmosphere, which is essentially global warming. More people are exposed to heat, resulting in more heat-related deaths, including those from heat waves. Increasing heat could also lead to more respiratory and cardiovascular dysfunctions. This would prove fatal for people with thermoregulatory impairments, wherein their body could not adjust to increasing heat, resulting in many bodily affectations, 
and loss of function. People with spinal cord injuries and people who are elderly are among groups more vulnerable to heat-related diseases. Farmers are also heavily affected by heat as they need to work outdoors. Not only this, crops could also fail to adapt to the increasing heat, resulting in less produce and eventually less income for the farmer and their family. An, exam an example are cocoa farmers in Nigeria, wherein they, the farmers there don't have resources to employ irrigation, therefore having less cocoa production. Oceans are also getting warmer with the IPCC's fifth assessment report stating that 93% of excess heat has been stored on the oceans since 1970, so 50 years ago. And believe it or not, carbon emissions also contribute to ocean acidification because 20 to 30% of excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere since 1980 is being taken in by our oceans as stated in the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate. Both of these conditions make it harder for marine life to survive, especially corals that undergo rapidly bleaching because of these conditions. Warmer water temperatures would also lead to higher algal bloom, which could foster red tide. This would inevitably lessen marine productivity which will generate less food and income, negatively affecting lives and livelihoods, especially for the fisher folk. Talking about food, it is also becoming more of an apparent concern. Food is becoming less nutritious. Multiple studies found a correlation between nutrition and carbon dioxide levels. Higher carbon dioxide concentrations could make food such as wheat, rice, and maize less nutritious, mainly in terms of zinc and iron. Undernutrition could also compromise the immune system of individuals, making them vulnerable or susceptible to catching diseases. It could also lead to nutritional diseases and various dysfunctions. However, studies also show that higher carbon dioxide in the atmosphere could increase food production, but this benefit is outweighed by its disadvantages. Accessibility in the form of availability is lessened as warmer oceans foster good conditions for locust breeding, and these locusts damage crops. Higher carbon dioxide concentrations also make crops less resilient to pests. And now the pollinators such as bees, and the butterflies are also slowly dying because they can't adapt to changing weather and temperature. This further decreased food availability and also impacting ecosystems. Another form of accessibility is affordability. If demand cannot be met with supply, price increases, making vital goods such as food less affordable, which would heavily impact people who don't have enough money to buy the product. Veering away from food and talking about water, clean water precisely, clean water is growing inaccessible because of changes in water cycle patterns. Fresh water sources could also harbor pathogens because of increasing water temperatures, which make it a better condition for breeding. Droughts and flooding, which increase in frequency if mismanaged, also decrease water accessibility, leading to dysfunctions. Air pollution, exacerbated by continued fossil fuel use and incineration by products, also impact the health of individuals. The more communities are exposed to air pollution, the more they are at risk of heart and pulmonary diseases. There are actually also studies showing the correlation between air pollution and heightened COVID-19 risks. Inaccessibility to healthcare services would also be heightened because of the climate crisis. During heavy storms, it would be harder for people living in rural areas to travel to the nearest healthcare facility, especially if the roads are just reversible through walking 
and not by motorbikes, cars, bicycles, and other forms of transportation. Healthcare professionals would also have a harder time providing home care services because they can't traverse the roads. The weather could also disrupt internet or mobile networks, limiting telehealth, telemedicine, medicine, or tele-rehab services. Most evacuation centers could also be ill-equipped to handle large amounts of evacuees, and there could also be inaccessibility for persons with disabilities. There could also be a lack of trained professionals to provide health services. An example would be during Typhoon Haiyan or Yolanda in the Philippines, which was in 2013. Mental health and psychosocial services were provided for survivors, though only a few healthcare professionals are trained to deliver the MHPSS. There was also a lack of standardized tools as different teams used varying procedures during their visits, which made their visits counterproductive. Now we can see that disasters can increase the emergence of depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and other mental health illnesses. Migrants, survivors, refugees, and displaced individuals in the context of climate change and disasters are also belonging to vulnerable groups. According to the International Organization for Migration's World Migration Report 2020, there are an estimated 272 million migrants globally, including climate migrants, and around two-thirds of them are laborers. They experience forms of inaccessibility, especially access to good shelter, which provides them protection from various elements. And public and healthcare services due to structural and systemic racial and sexual discrimination or prejudices. Their worries, along with inaccessibility to daily needs, could further affect their mental health. Biodiversity and species are declining because of land and marine warming, but more frequent wildfires, deforestation, and intensifying climate change, among other drivers behind habitat loss, are also significant factors. If more habitats get destroyed or damaged, our interactions with wild animals, wildlife may increase. This then could lead to the emergence of new infectious diseases, mainly zoonotic in nature, such as the avian flu. There are also studies showing the correlation between deforestation and tick-borne disease transmissions. More tree cover loss, could mean higher tick-borne disease transmissions. This was found to be the case for the scrub typhus disease in India and South Korea, as well as Kashanur forest disease in India. Aside from tick-borne diseases, other vector-borne diseases such as malaria are also growing in numbers because the climate crisis makes conditions suitable for breeding compounded by poor sanitation and drainage. Even without the presence of diseases, our quality of life is actually impacted by the climate crisis. Doing physical activity, whether through exercise, any form of exercise, or even simply walking, could be lessened by more frequent rainfall or even more frequent hotter days. Our motivation to go out may also be lower especially when we feel hot or if it's raining outside. And if, even we, and if we even go outside to do these things, we are exposing ourselves to health risks. Our engagements with activities relevant to us could also be impacted. Physical interactions with our friends, participating in community activities, events and programs, and going to the gym or attending yoga sessions, these are just among the activities that may be relevant to us, which could be harder to perform during, under the climate crisis. So now we've seen how this global crisis impacts our health and that social inequities and inequalities 
contribute further to the affectations, to the impacts, and how people are affected. Nonetheless, we have the means to not only control and combat the global crisis, but also we have the means to help people be more resilient to its impacts. When we talk about climate mitigation, we lessen our GHG emissions and also help suck in existing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Shifting to renewable energy should be a priority rather than maintaining fossil fuel industries, which would not only provide cleaner air, less carbon emissions, but also generate jobs for the unemployed, especially those who can be possibly affected when the fossil fuel plants are shut down. We also need to develop nature-based solutions. So take care of the environment, our forests, peatlands and mangroves, among other natural areas, so that communities will be less impacted by disasters such as landslides, tsunamis, and flooding. One way to get this is the adoption of indigenous knowledge and techniques. Indigenous people around the world have the ways to thrive off the land without damaging it. And it's up to us to acknowledge their tradition and learn from them, inculcate their practices in our efforts to benefit from, and more importantly, kill the land. Work with them instead of antagonizing and combating them. These are just some of the systemic solutions we can take to combat the climate crisis and to act swiftly because time is running out. Although the time to take climate action was decades ago, we can still combat the climate crisis now. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I've actually just forgotten your name, which is quite unfortunate. Manik, can you remember? <laughs> oh my goodness. It's Patrick Ryan Bellow. He's Patrick. also called Rain. Ah, uh, yeah. Sorry that I forgot your name there. I, your speech was really, really good. I really liked how you linked science, but also the impact it has on people. I think it's so important to, to talk about both. So we, we can see the human impact that climate change has, but we also understand the cause of it. Um, so I thought it was great that you managed to link those two things together. Now we're going to hear from another speaker. So we're going to be hearing from Sunal Gupta. Sunal Gupta is an economics graduate and currently pursuing a master's in international studies from Christ's University, Bangalore in India. Sunal has worked with Ernst & Young LLP for two years as an analyst and got to explore the inner workings of a management consultancy. Furthermore, she has volunteered in the sector with Make a Difference Child Education as a teacher to sixth grade students and as an, an activist volunteer with the Christ's University chapter as a marketing volunteer. Sunal helped raise I'm not even sure what this currency is, INR, it, it might be an Indian currency, 60,000 out of the sales of organic products of the activist chapter. Sanal has been on the organizing committee chief, she has been the organizing committee chief for Young Leaders Summit 2020, organized by Product Enviro Aware in October. Apart from being an organizer, she was also one of the panelists who spoke about the aspect of the green economy with respect to the debate surrounding the green recovery from COVID-19 focusing, uh, keeping on in focus the role of corporate sector and private investments in climate change mitigation. She is currently involved as a volunteer content creator at One Earth, an environmental startup based out of New Delhi. So we look forward to hearing from you, Sunar. I'm excited to learn more about the NDCs. Greetings to all the climate leaders here. We are living in an age of undeniable climate change. A type of change that will have an impact on us for generations to come. As a matter of fact, we already are experiencing that impact. Impact in the form of elevated carbon emissions, increased global warming and subsequent sea level rise, ravaging wildfires that have decimated acres of forests, lands, declining forest covers around the world, climate induced disasters such as cyclones, inevitable floods, droughts, famines, etc., especially in tropical countries such as Vietnam. We are at the edge of the map, but we are still waiting for that moment when we ha would have no choice but to take drastic measures to survive, immense trade-offs to save the world and humanity, or else lose the edge. Over centuries, we have fought amongst ourselves to survive, wars after wars for dominance, and the bloodshed was the crushing cost that somehow we were able to live with. The human race has been, unfortunately, extremely selfish. 
And sadly, our best learning occurs when we lose what we neglect to value out of the selfishness. Our environment is the prime example. 2015 was the year when leaders of the world came together to sign the landmark page-turning agreement, the Paris Agreement. Even though carrying a great deal of uncertainty, when 195 ratifying member countries had signed off on preparing and submitting national carbon commitments or nationally determined contributions every five years, which would then be subjected to global stock take, the first one to happen in 2023. The global stock take is where experts around the world receive data on the respective members countries NDC and progress reports and conduct reviews and publish the key findings to keep track of how these countries have furthered their efforts on the 1.5 degree Celsius 2050 target of the Paris Agreement. These NDCs facilitate an excellent step in ramping up efforts toward the climate target. The member countries are offered a direction and a support base by virtue of submission of their game plans or NDCs and the reviews that they receive from the agreement to help them build on their previous efforts and streamline them. Earlier I had mentioned the NDCs to be carrying a great deal of uncertainty. The reason is very simple, internet oversight. This means that the member countries have enough flexibility when they formulate their climate mitigation equations. Enough flexibility implies loopholes, deadweight expectations, and even complacency or neglect. It implies manipulated data. These issues arise because some countries are not ready to bear the trade-off that comes along with environmental protection, that is, development, socio-economic, or infrastructure. Choosing development in a highly competitive international system over environmental protection is a compelling action. And these countries are usually developing or emerging economies. Let's take the example of India. Home to 1.3 billion people and the second largest democracy in the world, India is a developing emerging economy that at the same time is battling the climate crisis in terms of climate mitigation and adaptation through effective renewable energy management and rigorous efforts to turn coal use into clean coal use. 53.6% of the power generation of India's installed capacity is coal-based. Furthermore, as per India's NDC, coal will continue to be a dominant source of power generation in the country. This means that the government of India will have to put in twice the effort in mitigating the carbon footprint of coal synthesis than it already has been putting in. Every developing country has that one factor to battle climate change. One challenging factor for India, it is coal. Now there are five factors that make climate mitigation a Herculean task. Number one, population. As I mentioned earlier, India accounts for 17.7% of the world's population, distributed highly unequally. Each person in the 17.7% or the 1.3 billion figure has energy, housing, food, security and lifestyle needs. This makes achieving the set climate target exponentially difficult because, most, because of the intended lack of oversight over such a large population even if it's a decentralized democracy. Number two, geography. India basically is the hegemonic power in South Asia. It is home to abundant natural resources and hydropower, especially hydropower. With an immense land surface area among the countries in South Asia, India is always vigilant about safeguarding its abundant natural resources. Number three, type of economy. India is historically and essentially an agrarian economy, even though the shift to the mixed economy took place several years ago. Its 1.3 billion people depend on its agricultural economy every day. Due to the climate-induced seasonal droughts or elevated levels of precipitation, agriculture takes a significant setback. With farmer suicides being one of the plaguing challenges that the country faces, the government of India struggles between keeping the farmers alive 
which implies intensive farming techniques and methods and making tough decisions to save the environment and probably hurt its quality. Number four, social constraints. A pluralistic country like India often finds itself at crossroads with managing ancient beliefs with pragmatism. The country has had numerous religions and cultural beliefs bear fruit on its soil. And these beliefs sometimes come at a great environmental cost. However, the chief minister of New Delhi implemented a ban on bursting firecrackers this year is a hopeful step. Aside from great environmental measures, Indian people across the states have taken steps to ensure reduced carbon emissions in the celebrations for more than a couple of years now. Therefore, one can see environmental sensitivity on the rise among the people. This is just one instance of many other instances. Number five, economic constraints. As I mentioned earlier, there is always a significant trade-off between economic development and environmental protection. In any developing country, poverty is the biggest challenge in a lot of respects. About 30% of the country's population is poverty-stricken. The latest unemployment statistic stands at 5.4%, not accounting for the perils of the pandemic. However, the upside of going for the green economy is the thousands of jobs that would emanate out of it. For example, the installation of hydropower systems or the integration of renewable energy in the national grids are quite labor-intensive and green procedures. India's NDC also highlights the problem of achieving the most eloquent human index, development index, which is too crucial to be let go of for any developing nation. On concluding thoughts, we live in a world where multilateralism is the key to correcting climate change. Multilateralism is what got the Paris Agreement into force. Multilateralism is what got the wheels on Doha Amendment in October this year turning. This is a common thread in most countries' NDCs, the requirement of external or international cooperation and assistance. This implies inclination not towards unilateralism but a multilateral effort. Climate change is a global public good and the existence of the nationally determined contribution submissions is a great assurance of the countries developed and developing being together in this. It is when the leaders of the world unite for the common problem, their people unite. Even today, climate sensitization is suffering. A lot of people are not aware of the depths of what this problem really is. Another strain is the lack of extended assistance from developed countries towards the developing nations. International carbon markets are great facilitators of the developed and developing countries' cooperation. However, the realism ingrained in the politics of the nations pulls the selfless good that can be done. Thank you. Sanal, thank you so much for your comment about how the developing countries really need to help out the developed because we are all together. And, you know, really the importance is that we understand that climate change has no barriers and we really need to work together and politics can get in the way, but we really need to see beyond that. So our next speaker is actually John Lil Algal. John Lil Algal is the program manager of Living Laudato Si Philippines, an interfaith movement campaigning for fossil fuel divestment and lifestyle and attitudinal shifts towards sustainability. He has represented the Philippines and the youth sector in different capacities during global and regional UN climate conferences since 2017. He is a citizen journalist focusing on climate and environmental stories since 2016, and one of the co-authors of the first Philippine Climate Change Assessment Report series, the local equivalent to the IBCC reports. He earned his MS Atmospheric Science degree from the Antonio de Manila University, excuse me, in December, 2018. So yeah, let's start off with this video then. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Distinguished delegates, fellow advocates and experts, and everybody watching around the world, good day to all of you. 
I am delivering this message from the Philippines, which earlier this month experienced one of the strongest typhoons on record, Typhoon Goni. Nearly seven years to the day of the impact of another super typhoon, Haiyan, which warned the world of the consequences of inaction on the climate crisis. The year 2015 saw the formulation of the Paris Agreement, which is celebrated as a milestone as the world has seemingly found a path towards addressing the climate crisis, which is undeniably the gravest threat to anthropogenic and natural systems in the present and the future. There was finally unanimous recognition among all countries that global warming is primarily driven by excessive human-induced emissions of greenhouse gases and thus must be addressed by drastically reducing global warming pollution and enhancing adaptive strategies towards sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been five years since this landmark moment in our history. While progress has been achieved in certain aspects, including the formulation of the Paris Agreement Work Program, the same challenges that have hampered the progress from the previous 25 global negotiations still remain and threaten to undermine decisive climate action. The divide between developed countries that are historically the highest emitters of greenhouse gases and developing countries, most of whom are highly vulnerable to climate change impacts on issues still remain as wide as ever, especially pertaining to issues about climate finance and loss and damage, both of which must be urgently addressed. The familiar rhetoric is on the brink of becoming tokenistic. This reality is reflected in the nationally determined contributions, which all parties must update and submit by the end of this year. Unfortunately, the current pledges for climate change mitigation under the latest NDC submissions are nowhere near enough to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by 2030, instead resulting in a 2.9 to 3.4 degree warmer world where minimizing or reversing climate change impacts would be improbable. Even the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is projected to result in a 6% drop in this year's greenhouse gas emissions, is not enough because to achieve a 1.5 degree warmer world, we need to achieve a 7.6% reduction in annual greenhouse gas emissions. This is as clear of a sign as any, that the NDCs must not only be submitted by the end of this year, but also reflect higher commitments in reducing global warming pollution and enhancing adaptive capacities across all countries. As of early November, only 12 countries have submitted new targets in their respective NDCs. Several countries have already expressed their intention to not update their targets, including the United States, Russia, and Japan. Three of the five highest current emitters of global warming pollution. This is in contrast to the requirement for succeeding NDCs of all parties to have higher ambition. One of the core elements for the successful realization of the goals of the Paris Agreement. Furthermore, the impacts of the ongoing pandemic are causing nations to reevaluate their national development strategies and slow down the finalization of their NDCs. The goals of the Paris Agreement are improbable to achieve without the proper decisive commitment of countries, especially the high emitting parties. A lack of updated NDCs is a reflection that these countries do not take this crisis with the required urgency or seriousness, especially with less than a decade to go to limit global warming. For highly vulnerable countries and communities, this also signifies more extreme climate change impacts, and which would result in more economic, social, and environmental loss and damage that worsens poverty, widens inequalities, and hinders national development. 
The roadmap to a 1.5 degree warmer world has already been clearly established by the best available science. Countries must urgently enhance their commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in their respective NDCs, aligned with the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming. A global state of net zero emissions must be achieved by the year 2050 with renewable energy supplying around one half to two thirds of the world's energy needs and up to 97% global electricity demand. Fossil fuels must be faced down with coal virtually being faced out. Aside from higher ambition, other principles related to climate action that have been established under the UNFCCC and other frameworks and agreements during the past few decades must be upheld, especially the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. Developed countries must commit to drastic emissions reductions and providing adequate financial and technological aid to vulnerable states through clearly established flows and mechanisms, including the U 100 billion US dollars every year commitment that could help them minimize, if not avert loss and damage. Developing countries must pursue low emissions development strategies and also enhance their adaptive capacities, but partly with support from developed countries. Enhanced NDCs must also be characterized and communicated with transparency in accordance with the guidelines of the Paris Rule. All climate change mitigation and adaptation options to be included in enhanced NDCs from renewable energy development to enhancing natural carbon sinks to adopting climate smart agricultural practices and sustainable transport must be implemented in a way that upholds social and climate justice, especially for the sake of those who are most vulnerable. Any proposed solution that results in the degradation of planetary and human well-being while benefiting those with vested interests through accumulation of even more financial or political capital is nothing more than a false solution. In addition, the linkages between emissions reductions measures and cross-cutting issues with implications on enhancing adaptations such as poverty alleviation, gender equality, health, climate change education, and youth development must be clearly presented in the finalized NDCs. This would strengthen the engagement of non-government stakeholders and improve the formulation, implementation, and monitoring of identified mitigation and adaptation options and other long-term strategies aligned with current national plans for low-carbon, resilient, and inclusive development. An important avenue for enhancing NDC commitments is scaling up nature-based solutions, which are more cost-effective in the long run than corresponding engineered solutions. Among these actions include enhancing natural carbon sinks, such as forests and blue carbon, which is just as important to achieving a net zero emissions world by 2050 or even sooner as initiating a just transition to a renewable energy power world. Their co-benefits on biodiversity conservation, food security, increased resilience to natural hazards, and livelihoods for local communities are especially crucial for the sustainable development of vulnerable countries. Currently, at least 66% of current pledges include nature-based solutions as part of their mitigation and or adaptation goals, although only a few of these come from high-income nations. Furthermore, many of these commitments lack robust, quantifiable targets and lack synergies between mitigation and adaptation measures. Engineered solutions also continue to receive far more funding than nature-based solutions, a reality that must be changed on the road to a 1.5 degree warmer world. Climate action has already been delayed for decades due to misinformation propagated by fossil fuel interests, hesitation of governments for decisive action, and unwillingness of stakeholders to initiate the societal transformation necessary 
to avoid catastrophic climate change. The COVID-19 pandemic must not be used as an excuse by governments to delay the submission of their NDCs. Rather, it should serve as a reminder that everything is interconnected, that attacks on the environment are attacks against humankind, and that it provides an opportunity not just for green recovery, but also laying the foundation towards low carbon development and increased climate resilience. Ladies and gentlemen, the remainder of the year 2020 presents a moment of truth for humankind and the Paris Agreement. The crisis of the earth and the poor have never been louder. The voices of millions of people around the world keep growing stronger and stronger. The question is, will our governments choose to ignore these cries and calls and choose to favor the interests of those who embody the unsustainable concept of infinite growth on a finite planet? Or will they finally have the courage and willingness to listen and begin the inevitable paradigm shift? On behalf of my fellow youth of today, I express my hope that decision makers remember exactly what is at stake for the rest of this decade, for our collective futures. No amount of wealth or power can ever withstand the wrath of nature, especially when its balance and harmony has been disrupted for centuries. We were fools to believe that we can make the environment adapt to us, when the reality is the planet keeps on turning even when our world stops moving. We have all the tools and resources needed to address the climate emergency. As long as there is time left, as long as there is passion and compassion within our hearts and minds, let us strive to save our world, not as we know it, but for what it could be, for what we hope it can be, so that we can change it for the better. Ladies and gentlemen, an eternal summer is coming. If you think our current new normal would lead us to a happier ending, we will definitely pay more than just our attention. When it comes to the truth, let us not deny, but rather recognize and act upon it. Thank you. Well, that was a very good start really was it i just started coughing well thank you for that john <laughs> that was really that was really interesting um there was a line that i particularly liked is when you said we were fools to believe that we can make the environment adapt to us when the reality is the planet keeps on moving even if our world stops turning and i think that's really important to note that actually we need to we need to be at one with our environment we can't try and make it adapt to us because we shouldn't have made it change in the first place I think that was really great um, and it was also really it was really good to hear about some of the science as well and for you to pull out figures from that, that IPCC report I'm sure they'll be so pleased with how many times um, the IPCC have been mentioned they're sort of like local celebrities on this um, on this set of speeches so yeah thank you so much for that um, next up is actually our, our last speaker uh, for the day and there's actually two of them uh, it's I mean uh, for some reason, I've only got their last names, um, so that, that's quite unfortunate, really. I'm just going to try and find their first names. Here we go. Um, it is Anthony Burke and Stephanie Fischel, and they are from the Coal Elimination Treaty in Australia. And we're going to hear from them about the Coal Elimination Treaty. I've just remembered I've got a bio to read and I've not read it. So this is it. Stephanie Fischel is a lecturer in politics and international relations at the University of the Sunrise Coast, Australia. She is on the management committee of the Queensland Co Koala? Koala. Uh, koala. Oh, that's an animal, isn't it? Koala. How did I forget that? They're really sweet animals. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. Um, koala Crusaders and is a trained animal carer and rescuer. Anthony Burke is a professor of environmental politics and international relations at the University of New South Wales, Australia. His previous expertise his previous experience includes working as a human rights activist as well as research officer for the, for the Australian Senate's Environmental Committee, where he led the drafting of reports 
on the Jubilika uranium mine and Australia's response to climate change. They are the authors of A Coal Elimination Treaty 2030 and will be speaking on their proposal. And I mean, the ability for me to speak is just entirely lost. I mean, I'm really looking forward to breakfast, but that's probably an excuse. So uh, over, over to you two. Hello, I'm Anthony Burke. And I'm Stephanie Fischel. And it is an honor to be able to talk to you today about our treaty proposal to eliminate the mining and burning of coal by 2030. Climate activists work at many levels, on local campaigns, pressuring regional and national governments, and global corporations. But one area they are having less impact is global governance. This is not their fault. It's because governments want it that way. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change keeps environmental groups on the sidelines, and its consensus voting rules privilege the most powerful and recalcitrant states. This is why the Paris Agreement on Climate Change has voluntary targets and little accountability. It was a major achievement, but can it be trusted to save us from catastrophic global heating? Let's look at where we are at the end of 2020. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change now recommends limiting global heating to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which will require reducing global emissions 45% by 2030 towards net zero by 2050. Prominent climate scientists are urging even faster pathways, net zero by the early 2040s, because IPCC analysis fails to take into account feedbacks such as melting ice caps and methane released from permafrost. Global emission paths are still on track for a truly catastrophic 4 to 5 degrees Celsius of heating by the end of the century. State commitments under the Paris Agreement might hold heating to a slightly less catastrophic 3 degrees. And so far, no major greenhouse emitter has committed to the net zero target of 2050. The U.S. is withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. Neither the U.S., Japan, nor Russia, all among the world's largest emitters, will strengthen their Paris commitments. The European Commission has proposed that Europe raise its reductions from 40 to 55% by 2030, but this is not yet European Union policy. China is effectively aiming for net zero sometime in the 2070s. India's commitments track towards a two degree world, but there is no sign of it moving out of coal. In fact, when existing and planned investment in coal plants is combined, coal emissions will produce an extraordinary overshoot of the 1.5 degree guardrail, 317% of the Paris budget. And that's just one emission source. To break through this impasse, we are proposing a coal elimination treaty via which the world states phase out coal mining and burning as one by 2030. It could eliminate 40% of global emissions, save millions of lives, and be an enormous leap in efforts to tackle climate change. We know the agreement does not address all the world's emission sources, but it would be simple and achievable to buy time to address more complex challenges of transport, agriculture, cement, and deforestation. We also know that climate justice is important, but it cannot be achieved through coal-led development and climate delay. Fossil fuel emissions kill hundreds of thousands in countries like China and India every year, from ambient air pollution that lodges in people's lungs and causes respiratory illness, heart disease, and cancer. And for the climate vulnerable states in Africa, the Caribbean, and the South Pacific, climate justice means climate action. We suggest that developing countries should be assisted to transition out of coal with a fossil fuels transition fund raised by taxes on fossil fuel imports and sales. Government should be supporting coal communities with Green New Deal style policies to stimulate sustainable new industries, as has been successfully achieved in Germany. Climate vulnerable states are acutely aware of the many ways that climate change poses an existential threat to their futures. And this is why big developing countries like India, China, Brazil and Indonesia need to support this proposal. We began by talking about how the Paris Agreement is marred by nasty power politics that is delaying climate action. Our proposal finds a way around that by empowering civil society and climate vulnerable states to lead. 
The key is using the same pathway that led to the 2017 Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the Nuclear Ban Treaty, or the NBT. This extraordinary agreement happened in the teeth of concerted nuclear state opposition, who insisted we stick to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, even as they ignored its central demand to disarm. It began with a global civil society campaign led by the International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons, ICANN, who won the Nobel Peace Prize for their work. Then states like Mexico, Norway, and Austria picked up the initiative and held three major conferences on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. They then used the UN General Assembly to convene a conference to negotiate and adopt the treaty outside the framework of the NPT. The whole process took less than seven years and ended with a powerful new global norm against both the use and possession of nuclear weapons. We think the same process will work for a coal treaty. It can be led by the Global South and other high ambition states like those in the Powering Past Coal Alliance. Urgency is key now. Climate models estimate that without dramatic cuts to emissions, the carbon budget to remain below 1.5 degrees could be burned up within eight years at best, and 18 months at worst. Yet if concerted action begins now, and global heating can be held below 1.5 degrees, up to 150 million lives could be saved this century, and enormous upheaval and destruction can be avoided. The climate crisis presents us with opportunities as well as fears, but we can't rely on the Paris Agreement to take us to a better future all by itself. New ideas are needed, and civil society support will be essential. We are greatly honored by this invitation to present to this forum. Young climate activists are the future of our planet. We hope you'll get behind the Coal Elimination Treaty, discuss it, and promote it to your own governments and circles. Thank you. Anthony and Stefani, thank you so much for your speech about the coal emission treaty and how by eliminating coal, 40% of the global emissions, I mean, just reduces substantially and saves millions of lives. That's a really massive impact just eliminating coal does to the earth. And everyone, thank you so much for enjoying and keeping us up. Or Yeah, yeah thank you for being able <laughs> to understand my dodgy pronunciation. I'm still shocked that I got koala wrong. I mean, I've got family in Australia and koalas are genuinely some of my favorite animals. And I just entirely lost the ability to say the word. Not really <laughs> sure what was going on there. Yeah. <laughs> it happens, it's okay. It, it happens. <laughs> yeah, so thank you so much for coming along with us. And I hope you've been able to engage with these speeches um, and you've been able to submit questions to the, the panel so that in two days time when we have some of the speakers back, they'll be able to answer some of the, the questions. And if you didn't write your own questions, remember to go pigeonhole.at forward slash popcop and click the upvote. It's like a little arrow to say what your favorite questions are. And they'll come up the list. Um, and then we'll make sure to ask the top rated questions. So hopefully we'll see you then. Um, I'm sure there's other stuff we're meant to be talking about. Probably. Oh yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow we've got the second speaker release. So that will be with Malaika and Aoife. They will be walking you through the next set of speeches. So come along for that. Hopefully it will be great. I'm sure it will. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. I know, same, same here. I'm sure it'll be great as well. And thank you so much everyone for participating. It was really great. And I hope that, you know, you enjoyed it and it will inform you of different modes of thoughts and also be able to, you know, use it as a mode to actually take action through this program. But yeah, thank you so much, everyone. I remember to put your thoughts into the word of that's being run, that's been run, running, that I can't even speak now, the word of that is running throughout this event. So if today you had a particular word that popped up, um, I guess mine would be koala, I would put koala in. Um, and then the, the best, the words that most people say will be displayed in a, in a nice little graphic that's going to be changing throughout the week. It'll be wonderful to have them in different languages so we can see the sort of the diverse range of engagement that we've got. Um, hopefully there'll be like positive words or there'll be things about climate change. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow for the, for the second set of video speaker releases and hopefully we'll see some of you attending the panel where we can ask some of these questions.
Lovely. All right. Bye, everyone.